everyone, and welcome to the course. I normally begin my food politics course by bringing in a can of Coke and asking students to brainstorm all of the ways they can think of that this can of Coke is political. After all, the intersection of food and politics is not always obvious. The class normally comes up with a dozen or so ideas and then begins to slow down and stall. So in this video, I want to explore how this can of Coke is political. But let's start at the beginning. Coca-Cola was famously invented by John Pemberton, the Civil War, a pharmacist and Confederate veteran. After being wounded by a saber in the American Civil War, Pemberton became addicted to morphine, which was commonly used as a painkiller at the time. Seeking a cure for his addiction, he experimented with various medicinal concoctions, eventually creating a syrup that blended coca leaves from which cocaine is derived and cola nuts, a source of caffeine. The original formulation included alcohol as well, and was marketed as Pemberton's French Wine Cola. Pemberton widely marketed the concoction as a wonder drug and cure-all. Remember that at the time, medicine was not as regulated as it is today, and countless snake oil salesmen traveled the country seeking to make a quick profit from offering fake cures for nearly every disease. Pemberton himself claimed the drink was a valuable brain tonic that would cure headaches, memory loss, and sleeplessness, relieve exhaustion, calm nerves, and prevent constipation and impotence. He claimed that the concoction was particularly beneficial for ladies and all those whose sedentary employment causes nervous prostration. Pemberton even claimed that it was a most wonderful invigorator of sexual organs. Later, it would be marketed as a dietary supplement for upset stomachs before becoming simply a beverage. This transition from marketing Coca-Cola as a medicine to marketing it as a refreshing beverage occurred slowly, over a period of about 20 years, and was driven by several factors. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a growing temperance movement that campaigned against substances with addictive properties, even if they were initially marketed as cures. The alcohol in Pemberton's wine cola was removed in 1886, when Atlanta passed a temperance legislation banning the sale of alcohol. This prompted Pemberton to modify his recipe, removing the alcohol and replacing it with sugar syrup. Eventually, carbonated water was added to the syrup, creating what we now know as Coca-Cola. Further, changes in marketing preferences saw a growth in demand for recreational drinks overshadowing the demand for medicines of dubious quality. In this context, it made more sense for Coca-Cola to be marketed as a non-alcoholic beverage. By focusing on its unique taste and refreshing qualities, Coca-Cola was able to reach a wider audience, including families and children, capitalize on the growing soda fountain culture in the United States. Shifting the marketing focus allowed Coca-Cola to build a strong brand identity centered around enjoyment, refreshment, and lifestyle. This branding strategy contributed to its global recognition and long-term success. The shift also coincided with Pemberton's sale of the company to Asa Griggs Chandler, who focused on the business of advertising and distribution, promoting Coca-Cola as a delicious and enjoyable beverage rather than as a cure-all. Finally, Coca-Cola was also responding to changing regulatory environments. In 1906, the U.S. Congress passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, which aimed to prevent mislabeling and adulteration of food and drugs, leading to stricter regulation of medicinal claims. This legislation made it more challenging to market Coca-Cola as a medicine and further encouraged the company to focus on its beverage identity in order to comply with the new regulations and avoid legal issues. Looking at the early advertising campaigns, and even campaigns into the 1960s, a very interesting and very gendered image emerges. In Coca-Cola's early advertising, gender played a significant role, often reinforcing traditional gender roles and stereotypes. Coca-Cola initially positioned itself as a health tonic that could alleviate exhaustion and calm nerves, emphasizing that Coca-Cola was beneficial for ladies, and suggesting that women who were often confined to domestic roles or sedentary jobs would benefit from the drink's invigorating properties. These early advertisements often depicted women in ways that were reflected in contemporary ideals of femininity. These ads showed women gracefully poised and refined, often enjoying Coca-Cola in elegant settings. By associating the drink with these ideals, Coca-Cola aimed to appeal to women who aspired to or identified with these images and reinforced traditional constructions of gender. 
ads for Coca-Cola frequently depicted women as homemakers and mothers, and often depicted them serving Coca-Cola to their families or to guests, reinforcing the idea that a woman's primary role was to care for the household and to provide hospitality. Coca-Cola was also often marketed as a refreshing drink for active and hardworking men. Ads often showed men enjoying Coca-Cola after sports, work, or other activities, reinforcing the idea that the product was masculine and energetic. And Coca-Cola's early slogans often targeted men using phrases like the pause that refreshes or the signs of good taste to appeal to their desire for a refreshing and sophisticated beverage. Some ads even depicted women as attractive and alluring, using their image to sell Coca-Cola to men. These ads often relied on sexualized imagery and objectified women's bodies. In fairness, Coca-Cola's advertising was similar to other advertising campaigns of the era, and more recent campaigns have made efforts to prevent a more diverse range of individuals in its ads, including women in various roles and from various backgrounds and races. The company has also launched campaigns to promote female empowerment and gender equality. But the advertisements nevertheless point to the way in which food is gendered, a topic we'll return to explore later in the course. The cocaine that was a feature of medicinal Coca-Cola was removed in 1903, despite the fact that cocaine itself remained legal in the United States until 1914. Why? For two reasons. First, there was increasing scrutiny on the health claims of various products marketed as patent medicines and growing concerns over the use of cocaine more broadly. From this perspective, the change to Coca-Cola's formula aligned with broader societal shifts towards more transparency in product ingredients and marketing practices. But racism also played a role. You see, before 1900, Coke was only available at segregated soda fountains. But after Coca-Cola began bottling the drink, anyone with a nickel could purchase the cocaine-infused beverage. Middle-class whites worried that the widespread availability of Coca-Cola was contributing to what they believed was a drug-fueled crime wave in black communities, which, according to government officials like Hamilton Wright of the U.S. State Department, targeted vulnerable white women. Of course, there was no data to support this claim. Nevertheless, Asa Griggs Chandler, who then owned Coca-Cola, bowed to public pressure and removed cocaine from its drink in 1903, adding more sugar and caffeine instead. The U.S. government classified cocaine as a Schedule II narcotic under the Controlled Substances Act, severely restricting its use. It was first made illegal under the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1914. But even through today, Coca-Cola continues to use coca leaves as an ingredient in its manufacturing of the beverage. How does it do this? Through a special agreement between the Drug Enforcement Agency and Coca-Cola, permitting the importation of up to 500 metric tons of coca leaves annually, primarily from Peru, where cultivation remains legal, to a special plant in Maywood, New Jersey. That plant extracts the alkaloids from the leaves, around 2 million grams of cocaine per year in total, and sells it to companies manufacturing anesthetics used primarily by dentists. And it processed the now decocainized leaves into a syrup for Coca-Cola. While we know about the coca leaves used in Coke's production largely due to required governmental disclosures and investigative reporting, the original recipe for Coca-Cola remains a closely guarded secret. Indeed, if you read the label on a can of Coke, you'll see that the exact combination of ingredients that give Coca-Cola its distinct flavor remain a trade secret listed only as natural flavors. This in part is a marketing feature. If you tour the Coke Museum in Atlanta, you'll visit a high-tech vault said to contain the original formula. According to company lore, only two people are privy to the complete formula at any given time. Those two employees are not permitted to travel together, and when one dies, the other must choose a successor within the company to impart that secret to the person. The identity of the two employees is kept a secret. However, the company's secret formula policy is more of a marketing strategy than an actual trade secret. Any competitor in possession of a genuine Coke recipe would be unable to obtain key ingredients such as the processed coca leaves, and even if all of the components were available, competitors could not market the product they made as Coca-Cola. This emphasis on trade secrets and copyright protection rather than patents is the result of the way intellectual property law works. If Coke were to patent its recipe, it would have to disclose the recipe and would gain a 20-year monopoly on its production, after which anyone could produce Coca-Cola using the official recipe. By keeping its recipe a trade secret and protecting it through brand copyright, Coke can maintain its monopoly on the flavor. 
Thus, while we know about coca leaves used in coke's production largely due to required governmental disclosures and investigative reporting, Coca-Cola guards the secrecy of its syrup by distributing its components across various factories under the guise of anonymous merchandises, numbered 1 through 9. Bottling plant managers are given the proportions and mixing procedures for these merchandises, but are not informed of their specific ingredients, as some merchandises are complex mixtures themselves. For example, merchandise number 1 is defined as sugar, typically in the form of high fructose corn syrup, Number two is caramel coloring, and number three is caffeine. Contrary to its name, it's believed that the current formula of Coca-Cola syrup does not contain the cola nut extract, which is originally used for caffeine content when Coke was invented. Instead, modern Coke likely derives its caffeine from caffeine citrate, a byproduct of creating decaffeinated coffees. Merchandise number four is phosphoric acid. The exact identities of merchandises 5 through 9 remain closely guarded secrets, particularly the mysterious merchandise 7X, which is believed to be a blend of essential oils, including orange, lime, lemon, and lavender, among others. The primary flavors of Coca-Cola are thought to derive from a blend of vanilla, cinnamon, and trace amounts of essential oils such and spices such as nutmeg. Interestingly, even Coke's competitors have been happy to help them maintain their secret formula. In 2006, a dramatic case of corporate espionage unfolded, involving Coca-Cola and its arch-rival PepsiCo. The incident began when three Coca-Cola employees conspired to steal trade secrets and sell them to PepsiCo for $1.5 million. The trio believed that their confidential information and the product sample that they had stolen would be of great value to Pepsi, given the fierce competition between the two beverage giants. They initiated contact with PepsiCo by sending an anonymous letter to Pepsi executives offering to sell the proprietary information. PepsiCo, however, immediately alerted Coca-Cola and the FBI to the attempted sale, cooperating fully with authorities to investigate the situation. The FBI launched an undercover operation to catch the conspirators in the act. An FBI agent, posing as a Pepsi executive, arranged a meeting to exchange the money for the stolen information. During these interactions, the conspirators provided the undercover agent with additional documents, proving the authenticity of their claims. The sting operation culminated in the arrest of the three conspirators in July 2006. They were charged with wire fraud and unlawful stealing and selling of trade secrets. In the ensuing legal proceedings, they were found guilty and sentenced to eight, five, and two years respectively, and ordered to pay $40,000 in restitution. Many of the ingredients that go into making Coca-Cola have political implications as well. For example, did you ever wonder why Coca-Cola produced in Mexico is sweetened with sugar, while Coca-Cola produced in the United States is sweetened using high fructose corn syrup? The answer has to do largely with governmental policies. In the United States, the federal government provides significant subsidies to corn producers. These subsidies make corn products, including high fructose corn syrup, much cheaper than cane sugar. As a result, in the United States, corn syrup is a more cost-effective sweetener for many food and beverage manufacturers, including Coca-Cola. Mexico, by contrast, has a strong tradition of growing sugarcane, and the agriculture industry there supports sugarcane production. This local abundance makes cane sugar more readily available and economically viable as a sweetener for beverages there. Even more, the U.S. imposes strict tariffs and quotas on imported sugar to protect domestic sugar producers. These trade policies increase the price of sugar cane further, making high fructose corn syrup an even more economical choice for manufacturers. There is also an important efficiency argument, as high fructose corn syrup is cheaper to produce and easier to transport than cane sugar, making it an attractive option for large-scale beverage production in the United States. Finally, in Mexico, there is a preference for the taste of beverages sweetened with cane sugar. This consumer preference influences manufacturers like Coca-Cola to use cane sugar in their products to meet demand. Many consumers claim that a can of Mexican Coca-Cola sweetened with cane sugar has a different, often preferred taste compared to American Coca-Cola produced using high fructose corn syrup. This difference has even led to the import and sale of Mexican Coke in the United States, where it's marketed as a premium product with a markup usually between 50 cents and $1.50 per bottle. Gum arabic is used in the production of Coca-Cola, serving as an emulsifier which prevents the ingredients, particularly the oils used for flavoring, from separating from the rest of the liquid. 
without gum arabic, the oils would float to the surface, creating an unappealing and inconsistent beverage. Gum arabic is a natural resin harvested from wild acacia trees found primarily in the Sahel region of Africa, with Sudan alone accounting for about two-thirds of global production. But many of the so-called gum belt countries face political stability and civil unrest, conflict, and limited infrastructure, which can disrupt the harvesting and transportation of gum arabic. The production of gum arabic is highly dependent on specific climatic conditions. Changes in weather patterns, droughts, or environmental issues, all exacerbated by global climate change, can significantly impact the yield of acacia trees, leading to supply shortages. Droughts, desertification, and overgrazing all threaten gum arabic production and the sustainability of the industry. One of the other primary ingredients in Coca-Cola is carbonated water, and production of Coke itself is a water-intensive process. A report issued by Coca-Cola Holland in 2010 stated that producing one 2-liter bottle of Coke required more than 140 liters of water, and competition for water has led to some political challenges for Coca-Cola. Indeed, in 2007, a widespread student boycott of Coca-Cola erupted across numerous U.S. college campuses, fueled by growing concerns over the company's practices in India. Student protesters alleged that Coca-Cola's bottling plants in India were extracting excessive amounts of groundwater, leading to a drastic drop in water levels and causing severe water shortages for farmers and local residents, particularly in rural areas where water scarcity was a crucial issue. They said that Coca-Cola's operations were polluting water sources with industrial waste and harmful chemicals, rendering them unfit for consumption and irrigation. In response, students in the U.S. and U.K. organized rallies, protests, and campaigns to pressure universities to stop selling Coke products on campus. Several universities, including the University of Michigan, New York University, Ohio State University, and the University of California, Berkeley, ultimately suspended their contracts with Coca-Cola due to the boycott, demanding that the company take corrective measures. The boycott significantly damaged Coca-Cola's reputation, and in response to growing pressure, the company pledged to replenish the water it used, improve its water management practices, and invest in community water projects in India. While the effectiveness of Coca-Cola's measures to mitigate water scarcity in India remain a topic of debate, the student boycott underscored the importance of sustainable water use and the impact of corporate activities on local communities. But the call to boycott Coca-Cola for its practices in India was hardly the first or the last call to campaign. In the 1980s, the anti-apartheid movement called for a boycott of Coca-Cola due to its business operations in South Africa during the apartheid era. Activists argued that Coca-Cola's presence in South Africa was supporting the apartheid regime. The pressure from the global anti-apartheid movement led Coca-Cola eventually to divest from South Africa in 1986. In the 1990s, critics of globalization sometimes used Coca-Cola as a symbol of American cultural imperialism, arguing that its global presence undermines local cultures and economies. Countries from France and India to Mexico and Brazil to Greece and Turkey saw protesters demanding local Coke boycotts aimed at promoting cultural autonomy and local alternatives to multinational corporations like Coca-Cola. In the early 2000s, activists accused Coca-Cola of being complicit in human rights abuses, particularly in Colombia, where labor union leaders alleged that the company's bottling plants were involved in intimidation, kidnapping, and murder of union members. The Killer Coke campaign, as it became known, was spearheaded by labor unions and human rights organizations and led to boycotts on university campuses and calls for Coca-Cola to improve its labor practices. Also in the early 2000s, increasing awareness of the health impacts of sugary beverages, particularly their contribution to obesity, diabetes, and other health problems, led to calls for boycotts. Public health advocates criticized Coca-Cola's marketing sugaring drinks, particularly to children. Campaigns focused on reducing the consumption of sugary beverages and advocating for better public health policies such as soda taxes. Around the same time, Coke and other major food producers faced boycott calls over the inclusion of genetically modified ingredients in their production processes. In more recent years, environmental groups have targeted Coca-Cola for its role in plastic pollution, as the company is one of the largest producers of plastic waste worldwide. Activists have called for boycotts to pressure Coca-Cola to reduce its plastic use and improve its environmental sustainability. These calls have led Coca-Cola to commit to recycling and reduce plastic waste, though critics argue more substantial action is needed. 
Coca-Cola ironically faced boycotts for both supporting gay rights and for not doing enough to support gay rights, reflecting the polarized nature of this issue. In 2021, Donald Trump called for a boycott of Coca-Cola after the company expressed its opposition to legislation in Georgia, its home state, that critics said would disenfranchise black voters in the states. And in 2022, Coca-Cola's ongoing operations in Israel, including bottling plant operations in the West Bank, have led to calls for boycotts as part of a broader campaign to pressure companies to divest from Israel. All of these campaigns highlight the ways in which Coca-Cola is seen as a political agent in the global system. And this is particularly because of its global operations. When it started, Coca-Cola was bottled in 44 countries around the world. By the early 1950s, there were 63 bottling plants worldwide, including across Western Europe and the Pacific Rim. Today, Coca-Cola is bottled in more than 200 countries worldwide, officially unavailable only in Cuba and North Korea, though even there it's often found in informal economies, making it one of the world's largest and most recognizable beverage brands. Coca-Cola relies on franchise distribution systems under which the company produces the concentrate or syrup, which is then sold to bottling partners around the world. These bottlers mix the concentrate with water and sweeteners, carbonate it, and then bottle the final product. There are thousands of bottling plants worldwide, ensuring that Coke products are produced and distributed locally, reducing transportation costs and aligning with local regulations and consumer demand. According to The Economist, the global ubiquity of Coca-Cola, its global distribution and bottling system, makes the availability or lack of availability of Coke an effective proxy for measuring the economic and political stability of a country. According to The Economist, when Coke disappears from the shelves, political and economic instability likely follows. The widespread availability of Coke sold in local currency terms has also encouraged political and economic analysts to look at the price and availability of Coca-Cola as a proxy for other factors. Analysts at the Zimbabwean securities firm Morgan & Company developed the Coca-Cola Index as a way of measuring the relative cost of living across countries in the region. Rooted in the idea of purchasing power parity conversions, they use the relative price of Coke in different countries as a way of determining the real currency conversion rate, which can then be used to determine relative gross domestic products. This is similar to The Economist's Big Mac Index and the Starbuck Index, interestingly all food-based ways to think about relative currency values. The Coca-Cola company makes more than just Coke and its related products. In fact, it produces more than 200 brands worldwide. This includes a variety of sweetened beverages like Barks Root Beer, Fanta, Schweppes Ginger Ale, and Sprite, water including Aquarius, Dasani, Smart Water, and Vitamin Water brands, fruit juices like Minute Maid and Simply Juice, and a variety of other beverages including Fairlife Dairy, Fresca, Powerade, High C, Monster Energy Drinks, and many, many others. All told, in 2023, the Coca-Cola company earned a gross profit of more than $27 billion based on total global sales of nearly $46 billion. It controls about 20% of the global soft drink market and just under half of the global carbonated beverage market, excluding carbonated water. Its largest rival, PepsiCo, controls less than 19% of the market. And in some regions of the world, like Latin America, Australasia, Asia-Pacific region, and Western Europe, its market dominance is even greater. The global reach of Coca-Cola's brand even gave rise to the idea of Coca-Colization. Along similar terms like McDonaldization and Disneyfication, these terms sometimes are used to describe the pervasive spread of American culture and commodities, symbolized most dramatically by the global reach of these brands. This process can be traced back at least to World War II, when then-president of Coca-Cola, Robert Woodruff, famously promised to see that every man in uniform gets a bottle of Coca-Cola for five cents, wherever he is stationed and whatever it costs the company. All told, more than five billion bottles of Coca-Cola were consumed by American soldiers abroad during World War II, dramatically expanding the reach and popularity of the drink. For American soldiers in World War II, it was an important sign of home and a, and a powerful morale-building product. But it was also a savvy business move on Coke's part. The popularity of Coca-Cola among U.S. service personnel ensured that the company was exempted from sugar rationing during the war, something that rival soft drink manufacturers could only dream of. And it dramatically expanded Coca-Cola's global footprint, helping pave the way for its contemporary global position. During the Cold War, Coca-Cola became a symbol of American capitalism around the world. 
Indeed, Coca-Cola was so closely associated with capitalism, democracy, and the United States that it was handed out by West Germans when the Berlin Wall collapsed in 1989. In Russia, the story is slightly different. Pepsi had entered the Russian market as a result of a deal struck in the early 1970s permitting Pepsi to import its cola into the Soviet Union. Since the Soviet ruble had no value outside of Russia, the two parties engaged in a unique barter system. Initially, PepsiCo traded Pepsi Concentrate for Stolichnaya Vodka, which it then sold in the United States. This unusual arrangement allowed Pepsi to establish a strong presence in the Soviet market, even amidst political tensions. By the time the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, PepsiCo had established over 20 bottling plants in the country. The agreement worked well for both parties until the late 1980s, when demand for Pepsi in the Soviet Union outstripped the country's ability to produce vodka for export. To continue the relationship and expand Pepsi's presence in the Soviet Union, a new deal was struck in 1989. The Soviets offered Pepsi a fleet of decommissioned military vessels valued at some $3 billion, including 17 submarines, a cruiser, a frigate, and a destroyer. For a brief moment in late 1989, this gave Pepsi the world's sixth largest navy, until it sold the ships for scrap to a Swedish company. But it also meant that when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, Pepsi's brand was associated with the old communist order. Russians wanted Coca-Cola, in their eyes, a symbol of Western freedom, instead. Consumption of Coca-Cola was more than just a preference, it was a key part of a new cosmopolitan identity. So through a simple can of Coke, we can talk about the collapse of communism, democratization, and the rise of the liberal international order, the politics of identity, the phenomenon of Americanization, global commodity chains and corporate concentration, political movements, civil society and the power and limits of boycotts, the global politics of water, the ongoing war in Sudan, the impact of subsidies and trade policies, corporate espionage, trade secrets and intellectual property rights, American drug policy, and the social construction of race and gender. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We could also talk about the politics of prohibition, the health impact of the modern American diet high in processed foods, trans fats, and refined sugars, the pouring rights that give companies like Coca-Cola monopoly access to schools and universities, the role of Coca-Cola in shaping American popular culture, including the development of our contemporary image of Santa Claus, global networks of shipping and production, the rights of farm workers, migrant laborers, and many others, and we haven't even gotten into the bottle, the plastic, or glass, or aluminum can. But the purpose of this video is not to pick on Coca-Cola. Indeed, we could engage in a similar exploration of the politics of just about any food item we consume. Rather, the takeaway is that politics and food cannot be separated. Everything we eat or drink, indeed every decision we make in our lives, is tied up in broader social, economic, political, and cultural issues and questions. And it's these that we're going to explore through this course. But I'm curious, what did I miss? Can you think of another way that this can of Coke is political? If so, let me know in the comments section below. Thanks for watching everyone, and see you in the next video.